Hello, everyone. Welcome to Worship for Hope. Glad you are watching. In this week's sermon, we're going to take a look at the Christian's response to the unbelieving world, how we can be strengthened by looking at Christ. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God shall come. He does not keep silent. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation may sprout forth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. God speaks to us in his word, first from the book of Proverbs, the eighth chapter. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city at the entrance, she cries aloud, To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was formed long ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. When there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there was no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given in place. I was given birth. Before He made the world or its fields or any of the dust of the earth, I was there when He set the heavens in place, when He marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when He established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep. When he gave the sea its boundaries so the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in mankind. From the book of Acts, the second chapter, a continuation of Peter's Pentecost sermon. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, you will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. From the Gospel of St. John, the eighth chapter. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. 
At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though so you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. You are not yet fifty years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. So says the word. We confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again, according to scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today I want to encourage you on the basis of John chapter 8, kind of continuing our, our mini-series through the Gospel of John. Last week's sermon ended with the truth that the world has always been sinful and not making light of our days and our times in which we live. Our days and our times are bad for us because these are the times that we know. We can be filled with confidence in who God is, what God has done, and it's important to be reminded of the world has always been evil. God is not raising his hands in despair, saying, I have never seen anything like this before. No, the, the world has always been evil, and humanity has consistently always strived to rebel against God. Today I want to talk about the encouragement that we have, can have, amidst the sinfulness of the world. With the theme, the world, our days, his church, and us. A little bit of background about John chapter 7 and 8. It's filled with this unique dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees. So Jesus makes a statement, the Pharisees respond, and there's this back and forth that goes on for two chapters. The, the event that sparks this is John chapter 7, we're told that Jesus goes to Jerusalem for the festival of tabernacles. What's the festival of tabernacles? That was a week-long celebration commemorating God's care for the children of Israel in the 40 years that they were in the wilderness. So God instituted this as a permanent event that was supposed to take place and uh, after they went into the Holy Land. And so Jesus is part of that celebration. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, the last day of the event, there is this powerful event, the last day of the Feast of Festival of Tabernacles, there's this powerful event that occurs. The people uh, have, uh, are, are located on the four corners of Jerusalem at the four city walls on the north, south, east, and west. And they have two things. They have a lantern and they have water. And at sundown, they all begin walking towards the center of Jerusalem, the temple courts, and they're singing responsively, beautifully, I'm sure. Isaiah chapter 12, 3, with joy I shall draw water from the well of salvation. And they're all slowly making their way. Can you picture it? all slowly making their way to the center of the city where the holy temple is. And at, as they come into the courtyard, who is there but Jesus? Jesus is sitting down, and we're told that he stands up. When he stands up, everybody eyes are on him, and so they stop singing, and he says, 
I am the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. So amidst the darkness that they're experiencing, amidst the, the, the lantern that they're carrying, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Amidst a world that is increasingly dark, I will and will always remain the light of the world. With that, that day of the Festival of Tabernacles ends, and Jesus goes back to the temple courts the next day and continues to be engaged in dialogue with the Pharisees. This whole dialogue finishes with Jesus making this statement. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple guard. So it's probably familiar to you. Jesus is clean to divine. He says, before Abraham was born, I am. With that statement, Jesus is connecting himself to the Old Testament uh, God, uh, the same God, the one that appears to Moses in the burning bush, when Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And the burning bush, God says, tell them I am has sent you. So the Pharisees understand this reference of Jesus. And so Jesus is claiming to be divine. He's claiming to be the son of God. One of the three persons of the Trinity, the God by whom, through whom, and in whom all things were made and all things exist. Jesus says, I am God, and they are enraged at him. They seek to kill him. It's interesting that the last line of that, but Jesus slipped away from the temple grounds. And the significance of that is, of course, that Jesus isn't ready yet. Everything isn't in place for him to die. And specifically, it is foretold how he's going to die. He's going to be betrayed, he's going to be denied, and he's going to die at the hands of the Romans crucified on the cross, not by the Jews and stoning. But when Jesus confronts the Pharisees in chapter seven and verse eight, they employ various means in order to ridicule him. They make in insinuations, they deny his existence, they make negative comments, and ultimately they seek to kill him. And what's so significant about that is we're told throughout Scripture that as the people treated Jesus, as the people treated the coming Messiah in the Old Testament and the reality that is found in Christ, so too shall they treat the church, so too shall they treat the followers. And what I want to do today is just spend time taking a look at four specific passages to help us understand the mindset of those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, who might mock us as Christians, who might disregard whatever promptings we might give them, or even those who are wavering in their faith. Uh, maybe they went to church when they were younger, but they gave up on organized religion a long time ago. Here is a mindset or what's going on in their mind and the means and mechanisms God's word supplies for us as to how we can minister them. First of all, from Hosea chapter 4, they have a lack of knowledge. The prophet writes, there is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the Lord. There's only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land mourns. My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. So they have a lack of knowledge. They have a lack of knowledge because of who God is, and they have turned and hardened their hearts against him. They also have a lack of perception, Romans 8, 7, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So we are born in a sinful condition. As we are born in a sinful condition, we are closed to things spiritual, but God, through the Holy Spirit, works in our hearts and in our lives to bring us to an understanding of who God is and what he has done. We can resist the Holy Spirit, though. We can resist the Holy Spirit by uh, hardening our heart at the Spirit's promptings. So we do not perceive 
the means and the mechanisms by which he is working. There is a lack of appropriation. The book of Hebrews says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So this is such an interesting passage, one of my favorite passages. It underscores for us the truth that, that Holy Scripture is alive. It's a living entity. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is working through it. So just think about reading. We read books, and whether you enjoy reading or it's not something you do, we all know about books or you've heard about books. So books can impact us in our lives. We might read a book and it can impact us in knowledge. We might read a book and it impact our emotions. We might say to someone, you have to read this book. It really is incredible. We say you might have to read this book because of what I gained from it. It opened up a new understanding. Uh, Holy Scripture, though, is different. Holy Scripture is living. The Holy Spirit is working in and through God's Word. So we can use this as a means and mechanisms to impact those who do not believe in Jesus Christ or who have fallen away, who have not officially given up, but their actions seem to indicate it. We can use God's Word as a means to draw them to the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can work in their lives. There's also a lack of humility. The book of James says, who is wise and understanding among you, let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Ultimately, to understand that we are sinners in need of a savior uh, needs an incredible amount of humility. It takes humility to say, I can't solve everything by myself. It takes humility to say, I don't have all the answers. It takes humility to say, there is a God, I am not God, and I am accountable to him. And sometimes, I'm sure we've all met people who disregard God, who turn away from him, who have no use for him. It's because they are ultimately proud and arrogant themselves. When we humble ourselves before God, when we acknowledge who God is and what he has done, that is the beginning of a lasting relationship with our Heavenly Father. So here's three takeaways. These are all passages from the Gospel of John. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In a world that is becoming increasingly dark, Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light that shines in the darkness, a light that the world cannot extinguish. John chapter 8, again, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So the, the truth of God's word, the truth of who he is, sets us free, sets us free from the bondage of our own making, sets us free from the bondage that we place ourselves in, sets us free from the bondage that others have placed us in, sets us free from the bondage of our own sin and our own unworthiness. In Jesus Christ, we are set free. God sees us not on the basis of what we are, but for what we have become in him, a precious, holy, redeemed child. And last of all, if anyone leaves, believes or keeps my words, they shall never see death. So that's encouragement for us to keep our eyes on the prize, on our eternal reward. We live now confident with the light of Jesus Christ. We abide in his presence, knowing, that, knowing what he has given to us. And we keep our eyes fo focused firmly through faith on our eternal reward. May God give you strength in that task. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. Blessed Father, from you comes all that is, and we are forever indebted to your grace for the gift of life. Receive this day our special thanks for the redemption you have provided in Jesus Christ, your Son, for the work of the Spirit in bringing us to know you by faith and to be adopting us, your children. Blessed Father, you have revealed yourself to us in Christ that we may know you by faith and confess you before the world. Give us your spirit that all churches may confess truly and faithfully your word and live in harmony of doctrine and life in anticipation of that day when we shall all kneel together at your altar. 
Blessed Father, you have established marriage and sanctified the home to be a place of blessing and love. Give to parents and children the courage to love as you have loved us. Unite them in their common life by your spirit to know Jesus and serve him. Comfort the widowed, protect the orphan, defend the helpless. Blessed Father, you guard your world as your own possession and have established governments and leaders to serve your purpose. Impress upon all elected officials that in their stewardship of the nation and state, they must serve faithfully and honorably for the benefit of all. Blessed Father, you have suffered fully the cost of love through your Son. Give healing and peace to all the afflicted, the grieving, the dying, the anxious, the depressed, and the worried, those dealing with chronic pain or earthly sorrows. Especially we remember Sherry, Ann, Tom, Ellie, and Bob. Give them all that is needful, that they may endure their days confident of your presence. Supply all of us with sufficient grace for our every need. As we pray the prayer that you taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a great week.